All right, hi everybody. We're ready to get started. Uh, we're still figuring out the pizza situation, uh, but in the meantime, uh, Patrick's going to tell you all about some news, and uh, yeah, I'll let him take it away. Hi. All right, uh, so briefly through the news this week, uh, we're going to start with our Chicago biohacking space that is launching. Hi, so I'm Colin, I'm a postdoc in the Lux Lab. Uh, when I moved to Chicago last year, I was surprised that the second city did not actually have a community biology space. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with this, um, this is really similar to the maker and hacker spaces that people have for creating software and hardware and just in general, new and useful things. So myself, uh, Andy Scarpelli, which is a former PhD student from the Leonard Lab, um, Isaac Larkin, Jordan Harrison, and Peter Sue, we are launching Chicago's first community biology lab. So we're hoping that our mission is basically to um, enable access to knowledge, skills, and tools of biotechnology to all the citizens of Chicago who want to use biotechnology to make Chicago a better place. So we're having our very first meeting, uh, August 9th at 7 p.m. at the Empirical Brewery Tap Room. Um, this is at Ravenswood and Foster. And we'd love for you guys to join us to talk about what a community biology lab can do in Chicago and to learn how to get involved. And you can follow us on Twitter at Chi-Town Bio, on Facebook at facebook.com slash chi Bio, and eventually, hopefully soon, by this weekend at chi Bio.org. Thanks. All right, uh, so we have a new episode of the podcast this month. It's uh, with Julius Lux talking about RNA engineering. You can find that on our SoundCloud. Um, by the way, all of the links for this are available in the email. Isaac sent out if you're not on the GameLabs listserv. Uh, when you get pizza, there's a place to sign up so you can get our emails. Uh, all the videos from Synthetic Biology 7.0 are available online, so you can find five days-ish worth of talks uh, for your viewing pleasure. Syn Bio Books, uh, we have a new one this month called Synthetic by Sophia Bruce, which is a first-person account of kind of how the synthetic biology field started. And then again, uh, Jennifer's book, uh, Crack and Creation, on her CRISPR discovery. Uh, there's a new website out, uh, Neolife, which is a, uh, sorry, I like standing off to the side. It's less intimidating that way. All right, so Neo Life is a uh, new blog from Medium, and there's a lot of different articles about uh, specifically focused on bioengineering. <laughs> there's a camera. Cool. Specifically focused on bioengineering. Uh, there was a cover story in Newsweek on uh, the new natural selection or how we're using bioengineering uh, to address a lot of problems. This is a very uh, I guess public friendly article, so you can share it with your friends and family. Uh, in the bioethics field this uh, month, uh, MIT uh, researchers reported that they had efficiently uh, used CRISPR-Cas9 to modify human embryos in the United States. Uh, there's an article in the Baltimore Sun, an editorial um, from Gigi here about uh, that we need to double down on our synthetic biology funding so we can maintain our competitiveness in the scientific fields in the country. Uh, she has written a lot of books on synthetic biology, biosafety, uh, things like that. So this is her, um, her book here, but the article is also on the Baltimore Sun. Um, the Audubon Society posted an article this month about uh, using CRISPR-Cas9 gene drives to uh, wipe out some mice and save birds, so this was a cool story to read. Uh, the Pentagon has partnered with the National Academy of Sciences to create a panel to study the threat of synthetic bioweapons. They released a preliminary report. Uh, you can read about that on Wired. Uh, and so what they are worried about are things like this, where a team in Canada spent $100,000 in six months of time, and they were able to, from scratch, create a smallpox virus. Um, Four smallpox. Horsepox, sorry. Yeah, big difference there. <laughs> Smallpox is not back. Um, <laughs> Horsepox, the point of this was to show that you can engineer uh, viruses for cancer therapy, but also has opened up a discussion on kind of the dual use and how easy this was to do. Um, DARPA has announced uh, grants for seven teams in the safe genes uh, toolkit, working on tools to uh, make these technologies safer to release and more resistant to editing and uh, loss or tampering. Uh, 
Uh, also in grant funding news, the NIH put out their first ever synthetic biology call for proposals. So this is an R01 mechanism sponsored by uh, Bioimaging Bioengineering National Cancer Institute. And so this has been really a big push. NSF is into it, DARPA is into it, and now the NIH is finally jumping on board. Uh, also in this month, big news, the FDA panel recommended the first synthetic biology uh, cell-based therapy, the T-cell CARS, for approval. This is Emily Whitehead, who was the first patient to get a T-cell CAR back in 2011. And now we're done with the phase three clinical trials. So this is very promising for um, the field and what a lot of this technology could wind up doing. Uh, so DuPont has secured the occlusive rights to a CRISPR-Cas9 technology for gene editing for uh, agriculture purposes. Uh, Google's sub, uh, parent company, Alphabet, has a subsidiary called Verify that is planning on launching uh, 20 million sterilized mosquitoes uh, in California. This is what a mosquito farm looks like, by the way. That's, I thought that was a pretty cool picture. Um, the Mosquitoes, Oxitec is launching their friendly mosquito project in Brazil. They have a contract to do that. And Arzeda, the, not talking about mosquitoes here now, Arzeda, which is David Baker's company, big protein engineering space, has a $12 million in their Series A round of funding uh, for his protein engineering startup. Uh, so a terabyte server of DNA would cost currently $2 billion. Uh, so Microsoft is really hoping that the prices drop on that as they continue to push into their let's store data as DNA efforts. Moving on to papers, here's a cool one on uh, these light-activated proton pumps being inserted into E. coli membrane, uh, and then you can use light to control the pH of the media. Uh, synthetic base pairs of DNA are a thing. There's two from this lab, DS and uh, DG, I think, that can be effectively copied uh, within a cell. Um, here's another synthetically uh, designed protein. This one has three lobes and has been engineered to bind to a target on cancer cells. Uh, Ribo attenuators are still a thing. People are, are improving them. This one is a little bit more modular. They claim uh, that it is now more resistant to having the downstream genes being swapped out and still functioning the way it was intended. Uh, this is a paper out of a group, and their goal here is they have this library of, uh, yeah, I know that, sorry. I'm great with my words. Uh, um, right, so they have a large library of synthetic elements, insulators, promoters, and their goal here was to be able to build circuits in a computer, predict them, and have them work. And they worked pretty well. Uh, so you can read this in Nature Communications. Uh, this is one where they uh, used scaffolds to improve the efficiency of DNA-based logic for DNA origami, so you can now do it faster and at lower concentrations of DNA than previously before by scaffolding your DNA. Uh, George Church encoded a video in a E. coli by using CRISPR-Cas9 to store the information and then retrieve it. So here's the stored video of a guy riding a horse, and here's the video that they retrieved from the E. coli. So pretty cool video. Um, Hopefully it can be more than a couple frames soon. Uh, Jennifer Doudna's group is now working on an inhibitor to CRISPR. So this is the ACR2A4 protein, which binds to the guide RNA CRISPR-Cas9 complex and prevents it from binding to the PAM site. So this is a natural inhibitor. Uh, and you can also use it delivered alongside CRISPR-Cas9 to decrease off-target effects. Um, in cell, other people are working on being able to study CRISPR-Cas9 using Illumina high-throughput sequencing. Uh, and so by using some fancy tools with fluorescent tags, you can watch uh, CRISPR work and bind to things with these next-gen sequencing technologies. Uh, here's one. And so cell-based therapies are currently done by pulling cells out of a patient and engineering them there. It takes five to six weeks. You have to have GMP compliance. But if you could just deliver the genes into the patient, that would save a lot of time and money. And so this group's created a synthetic nanoparticle uh, that can deliver the CAR genes right into the T cells in the mouse, uh, and they work pretty well. Uh, here's a paper from Jake Beal. Uh, if you ever wonder why things are always log normal in biology, uh, this paper has the answers. Uh, and then why was there a tardigrade on uh, our posters this week? And that's because a group took 
the, some of the resistance genes out of the tardigrades and put them in human cells to confer radio resistance to things like x-rays uh, and hydrogen peroxide as well. And that's it. Pleasure, I think, today to introduce uh, Special Agent Scott Malak. Uh, Malak? That's it. Malak, sorry. Um, who's the uh, coordinator of weapons of mass destruction for FBI, located here in Chicago, and he's got a really great talk ready for us. Uh, everyone really excited to hear what you got to say, so thank you. Hi, my name's Scott. Trust me, I'm with the government. <laughs> So just by, uh, so I know my audience, just by a show of hands, how many undergrads do we have in this room? Okay, graduate students? Doctoral types? Okay, wow. So there is like, uh, the brain power in this room is, is ridiculous. I'm gonna give you guys a, a disclaimer. My degree is in journalism. Um, I avoided the, uh, the hard sciences and I went the uh, Bachelor of Arts route, but um, don't let that deter you. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about myself with the FBI. Um, so I got my start about nine years ago. I went through Quantico. Anybody watch the, uh, the show Quantico on TV? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Quantico was just like that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I got my start at Quantico, went through the academy for six months, like all special agents do. Uh, my first office was uh, the Milwaukee office up in Wisconsin. I'm actually a Northwoods of Wisconsin guy. Do I have any? Packer fans in the room here? Okay, don't be afraid to put them out. There we go, okay. So born and raised, uh, maybe a half hour, 45 minutes from Lambeau Field, so diehard Packers fan. Um, season ticket holder in the family, Packers stock the whole bit, so it's in my blood. But I got my start in Milwaukee Division um, in a small office in Kenosha. So the FBI, we have 56 field offices, and then from there we have what we call uh, resident agencies, which are kind of remote offices. So Chicago has a handful of remote offices to the north, the west, the south, um, and then over at O'Hare uh, Airport. So I got my start up in Kenosha, Wisconsin, worked on national security matters, weapons of mass destruction, some uh, counterintelligence issues. And then I transferred down to Chicago maybe five, five and a half years ago. And I started off in national security work in counterterrorism. Counterterrorism has pretty much been my entire career, so chasing bad guys globally and then uh, got into the WMD role about a year ago. So with WMD, and, and granted, bio is a huge part of what we do, but it's, it's, it's a very small segment. So what this presentation is gonna do is really familiarize yourself with the WMD program, with the FBI, our reach back capability. Some of the cool stuff we've been doing lately in terms of uh, uh, case studies, uh, things like that. So I wanna start off with, and I gotta, uh, brings a tear to my eye, but I gotta, uh, edit this slide to former FBI Director James Comey. Uh, Director Comey was a, yeah, he was a great man. He really was. I actually had lunch with him back last October, and it was uh, one of the highlights of my career thus far. But, uh, but a great man. Everybody loved him in the FBI, and it's, uh, it's really a loss that, uh, that he left the way he did. But really, he says it best. Our weapons of mass destruction director continues to do the work and worry about the things you and the American people don't need to worry about because they do. Theirs is fascinating high stress and thankless work, and we labor in the shadows because our job is to think about and prepare for the worst so nobody here in the homeland experiences it. So this some of the areas that we're gonna be talking about today. So program interview, in terms of programs within the FBI, the WMD director is really the new kid on the block. And when I talk programs in the FBI, we're talking your criminal programs, your counterterrorism programs, white collar programs, uh, drug, gang programs, so the directorate, um, and what a directorate is, that's our own section up at FBI headquarters. So that kind of dictates the intelligence collection and what we do here on the ground level um, in the individual field offices. So what we do is uh, we go out and we seek and rely on intelligence to drive preparedness, countermeasures, and investigations to keep those threats from becoming a reality here. And we support the broader work of the US government 
and, uh, and policy through the uh, kind of the larger picture of the U.S. government up to the uh, decision makers. So these are the authorities granted to the WMD program, and we focus on a couple of different areas. So the explosive incendiary or poisonous gas release dissemination, or the impact of a toxin or poisonous chemicals, and their precursors, kind of what, what you guys deal with uh, here on the bio and chemical front, uh, disease organisms, again, on the bio side, and the release of radiation or uh, radioactivity at a level that's dangerous to human life. So those are the, those are the authorities granted uh, through us to investigate on the WMD side, and then we can, uh, we can prosecute. So our threats, um, when you think WMD, a lot of people think Iraq and what was going on and, and the search for WMDs early on when, uh, when President Bush was in power. Um, so the main modalities of WMD, your, your chem, your bio, your new, your radiological threats. But we also focus on the secondary threats of transportation, food, water, and critical infrastructure. So the majority of my time is dedicated to the chemical, the biological, and the rad new. Those are kind of our core threats. So on our chemical front, we deal with toxic industrial chemicals and explosive precursor chemicals. And this is the stuff that really keeps me up at, awake at night because this is the stuff that's readily available. This is the stuff you can walk into Lowe's or Home Depot and you can acquire this stuff to no end, right? There's really no, no checks or balances or stops. So really what my job is, it's to go out there and inform um, people that are on the front lines, people that are, that are working in these industries and these retailers um, what maybe a suspicious purchase might look like. And, uh, and, and if they see something, that funnel that information back to the FBI. Now, one thing we don't do is we're not going to go knocking on every door that they deem a suspicious purchase. That's, that's not what we do. Um, that's why we have a, a robust intelligence section. We work with our partners um, nationally, uh, within the U.S. intelligence community, uh, state, local partners, and rely on them for information so we can make the best determination on how we need to approach this threat and what we need to do. I'll give you an example. Um, five months ago, maybe six months ago, we had an issue with a guy walking into a supply beauty shop, and he bought uh, some peroxide that was uh, that was a very high-grade peroxide, right? So that's uh, something that can be used for an explosive device, or mixing chemicals to get an explosive device, are high-grade peroxides. So this guy walks in. He doesn't really know what he's looking for, but he buys like four bottles of this very high-grade peroxide. And the guy was kind of lost in this. And he's a bald guy too, right? Like me. I have no business being in a beauty supply place, right? <laughs> or barbershop for that matter. <laughs> so this guy walks in, he buys some stuff. Um, they call the FBI and said, you know what? There's this guy, he came in, he bought four bottles of very high grade, high concentrated peroxides. You know, the hair on the back of our neck is standing up a little bit. It just didn't seem right. He was outside of our normal customer base. He kind of deviated outside what a normal purchase would be, so could you guys check it out? So we did. So we, uh, we look at the leads, we, we run intelligence, we, we talk to our local partners, we get the full story on this guy, right? And then we're finally ready to do an approach. So we go to the guy's house, knock on the door, and we go in. So we start talking to him. And what he was using it for was he was a taxidermist. So he was using these to bleach um, deer skulls and different things like that that you kind of hang on your wall, right? Legitimate purpose, but but something like that. It's and with the WMD program, it's really all or nothing. So we approach every issue, no matter what it is, the same way. And we approach every issue um, like it's somebody that's gonna on their way down to the loop and, and they're gonna do something nefarious or disrupt commerce or, or take human life. That's how we approach every issue, in, in, unless it's deemed otherwise. So that's how important this program is, and that's how serious we take this. So then your biological threats. So one area we're really getting into is the DIY bio, uh, biohacking. And that's really one of the reasons why I'm here today. Uh, the other area that we get into on the biological front are your select agent labs. So people here in the audience, you guys know what select agents are, you know about select agent labs for the most part. Your tularemia, your, your uh, you name it, anthrax. You know, these are the things that are highly regulated that are in, that are in labs located all over the place. So for us, it's really important getting out and doing outreach and visiting these labs and kind of uh, introducing ourselves and seeing what their security protocols are. Um, also, one thing that keeps me awake at night is the, uh, the insider threat. So these are folks that are, that are vetted, maybe in the lab, maybe they're having a bad day, maybe they're having um, 
maybe some kind of disagreement with the government, you know, what have you, and they're going to go out and they are going to um, make it known, right? And by doing this, maybe they're going to take biological samples for uh, some kind of nefarious act. So those are things that, that we pay very close attention to as well. And then last year, uh, nuclear and radiological threat. So uh, radiological dispersal devices, uh, dirty bombs, improvised uh, nuclear weapons, uh, these are all things we pay very close attention to and we do a lot of outreach and we rely uh, a lot on our outside partners like the NRC and, and different regulatory agencies. Now, I want to tell you, and this kind of gets into the bio side later, but the FBI is not a regulatory agency, okay? And a lot of times people get that confused with what we do. What we do is we investigate issues and we prosecute, prosecute these issues to the Department of Justice. Um, so what I don't do is I don't, I don't come into your space and, and tell you that you guys are jacked up for what you guys are doing in, in terms of, of biosecurity or, or DIY bio or anything like that, right? My job is to come in here, tell you who I am, and tell you that we want to collaborate with you guys. We want to learn from what you guys are doing, okay? So I'm not coming in here to slap you guys on the wrist and tell you that your program's messed up. That's, that's not what I do, and that's not what the program does. Um, same thing on the uh, on the nuclear side. My job is to a nuclear facility and say, hey, I disagree with how you guys are storing this, or you don't have enough security around your spent fuel pits, or you know whatever it is. That's not my job. My job is to go out, uh, shake hands, get business cards out, get on the front end of these threats. That way, if something were to happen, and I'm showing up to a scene, I know who the subject matter experts are. I know who the main players are. I'm not trading business cards. Um, in the time of an emergency. That's really the wrong place to do it. And then from there, we got the secondary threats, transportation, food, water, critical infrastructure. Um, one of the great things about this job is I'm kind of on the cutting edge of some of these technological advances. So the whole DIY biofront, biohacking, stuff that you guys are involved in, but also on the transportation side with drones. Um, we have a very robust drone program at FBI headquarters. And one thing we look at is uh, drones being used for the dissemination of a, a nefarious act, right? Let's say uh, Lollapalooza. So, show of hands, who was at Lollapalooza last year? <laughs> <laughs> you got hit one person? <laughs> <laughs> College has changed. So. <laughs> I'm just going to sit down. This is ridiculous. <laughs> Well, you guys are poor college students, right? You can't afford the thousand dollars for like a three-day ticket, or whatever. Whatever we did, it's not charging. So I get it. So I'll, I'll use a great example. So one of the great things with this job is I get to go to these special events, and I lead the WMD program at these events. So Lollapalooza. Uh, last two years, I've been parked at Lollapalooza backstage at the uh, Samsung stage, kind of with my crew just uh, waiting for something to happen. Um, <laughs> seriously. So I called Paul McCartney the other year, I called Jane's Addiction last year, Chili Peppers. I mean, these are, these are this is what I grew up listening to, right? Jane's Addiction to Chili Peppers. I might be a little older than uh, some of you folks here in the room. Um, but it was great, right? So uh, my job is to go out there and always think worst case scenario. So one of the things that we think is somebody flying a drone, right? And, and putting some kind of explosive device, you know, white powder, whatever it is, on that drone, going over a crowd and, and letting loose, right? So my worry is, in a crowd of 100,000 people, you have a small explosive device, you plant it in the middle of the crowd, maybe it takes out three, four people, maybe more. But the real damage is gonna come, people rushing for those exits, and, and trampling each other, and the mass chaos that ensues, right? That's really where the, uh, the main damage is gonna come. Not only that, but the psychological damage. Could you imagine that? Let's say there's a large all the blues are, or, or at a Bears game. I'm a Packer fan, but I, I still wouldn't wish that uh, on anybody, <laughs> including the Bears. Um, but really, I mean, think about the psychological damage and the, the disruption when it comes to commerce, right? It would be huge. So these are things that we, we guess and second guess all the time. I mean, we rent sell this stuff. So in the, in the crowd, do we have any former military folks? What branch? Navy. Navy. Go Navy. Navy, right here. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. What you do in the Navy? Combat Corps. Oh, okay, you're an HM. Yes, sir. Awesome, okay. So I'm a Navy guy. So I've been in 24 years on the reservist now. Actually getting ready to retire in September. So uh, former enlisted, active duty the whole bit. But one thing that I do in the Navy, and, and I'm sure you've done in the past, is we red sell the heck out of everything, right? We did that in the military. Uh, we do that uh, here with the Bureau as well. 
we red sell everything, worst case scenario, everything. And it's really important because it lets us know what's out there and, and what the vulnerabilities are and how we can disrupt that and what we need to, uh, to counteract these vulnerabilities. So a lot of these threats, um, they're easy to, easy to acquire and, and it's easy to cause kind of this mass chaos. So uh, toxic industrial chemicals, explosive precursor chemicals, like I said, anybody can walk into a Homes or a, a Home Depot or a, a Lowe's, acquire these chemicals, get bulk chemicals, and cause mass chaos, right? So that's an area that we uh, we always look at. Same thing on the bio front, um, castor beans, you know, and and making ricin. How easy is it to go online and find a recipe for ricin? Now you got to have a little bit of sophistication doing this. Maybe uh, a controlled environment to, to carry out uh, a lab and, and make sure everything is, is doing what it should be. And it's important to make these liaisons and these contacts so we got folks that can come out and they can tell us um, what we need to be aware of and we can set these tripwires. So mitigating the threats. What we do is we identify opportunities for partnerships. One of the reasons why I'm here today in front of you is to develop a partnership and a liaison and a tripwire. And you give, give you guys really a uh, a point of reference if you come across anything suspicious. You know, like the old adage says, you see something, say something, right? Very important. So identifying the threats, establishing the countermeasures and the tripwires. Um, like I said earlier, with the, uh, the person at the uh, beauty supply shop, the woman there, uh, the professor, these are all tripwires. Um, these are people that are on really the front line of these threats. You folks here, you are on the front line of, of the bio threat. And, and if you see something that deviates outside of the norm, you know, give us a call. You know, even if you think it's nothing, we can do a lot of stuff behind the scenes. We are, a lot of people think we're this secret agency and, and we do all this super secret squirrel stuff. We do in a sense, right? And we can hide a lot of that from the public. We go out, we, we rely on our US intelligence community partners, whoever it is, and we can get this information and we do it behind the scenes. So that way if it's not something nefarious, this guy isn't, uh, maybe he's up to something that's, that makes sense, we're not disrupting this guy or, or these people. You know, we can do this in a way that's that's quiet and see whether or not it's a threat. So me as a coordinator, there are 56 coordinators in the FBI. I'm the WMD coordinator for FBI Chicago. Um, what we do is we act as a liaison uh, with you. We act as a liaison um, with FBI headquarters and the WMD directory. We do incident responses, we do training uh, exercises, you name it, we're involved in this. So one of my jobs prior to becoming a WMD director, I'm a hazmat operator as well. So I'm the guy that's all OSHA approved, I get dressed up in the tie back, I put an air tank on the back, you know, put the space suit on, go into a hazardous environment, we collect evidence, you know, whatever it is. And we're going to actually talk about that in a little bit. And then that kind of got me into the WMD program. I've actually been, I was an assistant coordinator when I was in Milwaukee Division, and then a year ago became a coordinator here in Chicago. So I've, I've a little bit of a history doing this and evidence collection and some other things that got me into this spot. So again, uh, we also act as a liaison with the private sector, FBI headquarters, the WMD director, and then in the WMD director, we have various countermeasure units that oversee each of the threats within WMD. So we got your chemical, your biological countermeasure unit, your nuclear radiological countermeasure unit, critical infrastructure countermeasure, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm down here, but I answer to many gods is basically what I do. And I'm, I'm, it's, it's, it's constantly juggling what the threats are and, and what I need to focus on and pay attention to. So threat assessment wise, um, the likelihood of a nuclear weapon going off in downtown Chicago is probably not there, right? Um, first of all, the sophistication to make a nuclear weapon is unbelievable. Now, keep in mind, I gave you the disclaimer at the beginning of the talk, my degree is in journalism, I got a BA, right? So, but what I do understand is there are regulatory agencies like the NRC and, and there's, there's thousands of them out there that have a very tight grasp on the nuclear technologies. So something doesn't happen, right? But then you start going up the scale. So chemical weapons, again, uh, maybe a little bit of a degree of sophistication. These are things that are, that are fairly well controlled. Um, Radiological isotopes, now we start getting into higher probability actions and attacks. Uh, biological and pathogen, pathogens, now you gotta have some degree of sophistication, you gotta kinda know what you're doing, you gotta have that controlled environment, and you gotta have a proper dissemination channel to make this uh, attack happen. 
Um, then we get up to the industrial chemicals and the explosive devices. Now these are things that are fired very easily online and anybody can really make in your, your basement or your garage. So how we mitigate the threat is through what we call a threat credibility evaluation. And then the government, we got a fancy term for everything, right? So basically what this is, it's a conference call. Okay, let's call it what it is, it's a conference call. <laughs> But what we do is we look at kind of a, a three-fold approach to validating what a, what a credible threat might be. So your technical feasibility. So let's say we get a call, somebody's maybe, we get a report that somebody's making ricin or some kind of biological toxin for something nefarious. So we get the call, we take a look, we're like, you know what, yeah, this guy, he's a grad student at Northwestern. Where, where are my grad students again? Yeah, not as many hands as <laughs> So he's a grad student at Northwestern. Um, you know, we, we talked to his professors or, or maybe his roommates. Yeah, you know what, he's been really PO'd lately at, at kind of the government's policy and, and some of the stuff that, uh, that President Trump has been doing. Um, you know, so that's, now we're looking at kind of two things, right? So we got the technical feasibility, we got kind of the, the know-how, we got the intent, right? Because he, he's talking displeasure about politics. Um, and now we're starting to look at the operational practicality. So he's a student at Northwestern. Maybe he has access to labs here. We don't really know that. That's something we got to flush out. So we take the three things. We look them. Uh, we kind of clump them together. And then we feed intelligence into that as well. Now we got a threat, right? And that's how we approach it. So what we do is uh, I make a call to the WMD director at FBI headquarters. We convene a conference call. Um, and we have, in this program, the reachback capability is unbelievable. So what we have on WMD is we have the FBI lab. So who's ever heard of the FBI lab? Why well, you got to be kidding me? What? <laughs> so we're we're my who who watches Quantico? That my one two people. Okay. So in Quantico, they, they talk about the FBI lab, don't they? Uh, not that I remember. Okay. <laughs> Quantico, stop. Stop watching Quantico. <laughs> so the FBI lab is really the the lab. In the, I'm going to say the lab in the world when it comes to forensic science. The stuff they do there is unbelievable. They hire the best and brightest uh, really the world has to offer. And the stuff they do there is, is amazing. Um, so you can, you, can, you can give them a shell casing from a, maybe a murder. And they're able to identify maybe the weapon. And the stuff they do there is it's, it's really science fiction. It's, it's just amazing. They have brilliant minds. So we can lean on them. We can lean on my other three-letter agency, CIA. Uh, Department of Energy, you name it, we can rely on them. Uh, other folks within the FBI, local partners, whatever it is, we can rely on these folks, and they can uh, they can help us making out the uh, the best determination on how we're going to approach this issue, and ultimately what we're going to do with it. And that also kind of controls our response posture. So we can mobilize our hesitant, absolutist evidence response team, our local evidence response team, uh, our SWAT guys. Uh, we can mobilize assets that are what we call national assets from out in D.C. So they can fly in big black planes and big black vehicles and suburbans, a whole bit. They can fly in scientists, subject matter experts, whatever it is, to help combat whatever threat it is. So again, this kind of goes back into how we coordinate those assets, uh, starting state and locally all the way up to uh, our national assets with the FBI. So contacts and resources, obviously your first call is always going to be 911. You see something. Um, suspicious activity in 911 or the FBI, but really what the FBI has, and, and I've kind of talked about this earlier, are robust um, uh, channels, communications, reachback capability, uh, national assets, um, international trends, international terrorism. We can see what's going on overseas. We get this information all the time. Um, and we can kind of marry that up with what's going on here. I can talk to my other 55 WMD coordinators located around the nation. They can tell me what they're seeing in their backyard. Maybe it's maybe it's ventured into Chicago. I don't know, but um, that's really the beauty of the FBI and some of the work that we can do behind the scenes. So there's some uh, information for you. Basically, go on Google, uh, Google FBI WMD. There's a wealth of information and case studies on it. So again, uh, Special Agent Malik, FBI. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. What is the time scale between like getting a phone call like somebody just bought some suspicious stuff at my Lowe's and having a conference, and then finding that person if you identify a threat? Uh, Quantico TV show, answer that question for me. <laughs> <laughs> Within like 20 minutes of the episode. 
Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Plus, plus or minus commercials, depending on how late the episode happens, right? No, so for us, our response mechanism is very stable, okay? So when that initial call, is go call goes out, I'll, I'll use Chicago as an example. When that call goes out, the first responders are going to be Chicago Fire Department hazmat. They're going to respond on the scene to all this stuff. But I'm clued in through the 911 center. I get email alerts and, and alerts on my phone about different things that are going on. So I'm usually notified about the same time that they are. But they're going to be the first responders. So they go out. They take a look at what's going on. If it's something that needs the FBI to take a look at or, or they think it's something beyond their capabilities, uh, they're going to get on the phone with me. We're going to start talking. And then I take that information, uh, arrive on scene, relay that information to our, our national folks, and we start getting the ball moving there. Any, yeah? So I just want to clarify this point. Did you say that political activism or outspoken political opinions are considered a risk factor for scientists working with bioengineering and biology? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I want to I wanna kind of steer away from the uh, from the political aspect, I'm not. I'm not really geared up to answer kind of the political considerations into this stuff. Um, I can tell you, there's there's a lot of concern, and I can tell you what often happens is technology often beats um, uh, the decision makers and and what they're trying to do. And I think often they're scared about emerging technologies, and they kind of have knee jerk reactions sometimes. Um, but it's important to have that that uh, that openness and that flow of communication both well, ways. Sir. Are agricultural pathogens from either state or non-state factors still a major concern like they were during the Cold War? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, that's something we, we always continue to look at, especially the, uh, the FBI directorate at headquarters. They, append, they really pay attention to the international picture. And we also have WMD folks embedded in various embassies overseas, so they're always looking at the, uh, the overseas stuff. Dude, you're killing me, man. There's pizza up here. <laughs> you mentioned that you don't do any regulation, um, primarily investigation, but obviously technology can really change rapidly. So, what type of communication is there between you, the FBI, and the regulators? So, I'll use uh, Nuke and Rad as a great example. So, there are so many, so many regulators on the Nuke and Rad sector. Um, so, we we work with the uh, um, Nuclear Regulatory Commission quite a bit on some of these threats. And they're really the go-to on this, these threats. So they're the ones that dictate in nuclear power plants where stuff can be stored, how much security is needed. That's, that's not an FBI mission, right? We are, we are worried about the insider threat, somebody obtaining something for some kind of attack or WMD attack or some kind of intentional release that's going to harm, harm life, right? But we have conversations with them all the time. Another example is on the food sector. So USDA is a regulator, right? Um, they go in, they regulate food processing facilities, um, you know, what have you. But we go out, we talk to these same facilities, but we educate them on uh, what we're looking for, the insider threat, the lone wolf attacks, people that have access to different things that normal people wouldn't have. So that's really what we do is the education and the liaison aspect of that. But we are constantly talking to the regulators. Yeah? All right, last question for me. Um, are there any federal laws that aspiring biohackers or DIY bio people should know about that they might accidentally run foul of during their activities? That's one of your questions for the, uh, for the podcast, right? Did you send me the questions <laughs> for the podcast? It's yeah. one of the questions. Okay. Um, say, say that again, one more time, I'm sorry. Are there any like, laws that we should be aware of as people who might want to do some biohacking in our spare time? Make sure we don't want to battle over <laughs> Maybe you and I should have a talk. <laughs> um, you know, not, not that I know of, I don't think. Um, again, this is an area where the technology is kind of outpacing the regulators and the lawmakers. And they, look at the, they often look at technologies like this, and they come up with laws to regulate it without really having a deep understanding of really what's going on. So, you know, the, the biological front and DIY bio, what an exciting field, especially when we're talking about the possibility of, of a racing disease and, and all the other possibilities um, that this, the science has. It's, it's incredible, right? But we're always worried about that, that, that fraction of a percent that wants to do something nefarious. Um, 
you know, so that's that's a worry. But to my knowledge, I don't I don't think there is. You know, I, I, I could be wrong. I mean, state locally, I don't believe there is. Federally, I don't believe there is. Don't take my word for it. But I mean, there could be something. Else. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Let's go.